more than this. Ah. What well, would you like to put in the rest of the wall? Rest? <laughs> بحب اضيفها انه كل كل انسان بيسمع الحديث يحط يقيس على نفسه اذا كان هو موجود في الوضع اللي انا موجود فيه هسا اول شيء انا ساكن السكن تبعت انتم تبعت انتم شايفين كيف وضعي بديش انا اشرح لانه انتم شايفين 100% الوضع اللي انا عايشه او جزء كبير من الوضع تبعي انتم فاهمينه انا عايش جوا قفص باختصار احنا كشعب فلسطيني موجودين في سجن والسجن ها في له اقسام وكل قسم في غرفه وغير الغرف في زنازين هسه انا موجود في زنزانه لما بخرج من الزنزانه تبعتي بتفاجئ انه في بخرج لغرفه في السجن لما بخرج من الغرفه بلاقي حالي في قسم في السجن لما بخرج من القسم في داخل السجن بضل جوا سجن هذا الواقع تبعي انا Hani and Munira Ama have been living under Israeli occupation all of their lives. Hani Ama's family were first forced out of their home in 1948 by the newly formed State of Israel. During their flight, Hani's grandfather was killed by the Israeli army. Along with nearly three quarters of the Palestinian population, the Ama family became refugees in what came to be called Al Nakba the catastrophe. The Amas fled to what is now known as the West Bank and settled in Masha village. Less than 20 years later, Israel expanded its control over historic Palestine by occupying the West Bank as a result of the 1967 war. Living under this military occupation, Hani and Munira built their own home in Masha village in 1972. Six years later, the Israeli government gave the green light for the construction of the Jewish settlement of El Kana on Palestinian land, land belonging to Masha village. During the 1980s, the settlement expanded until it reached the back fence of the Amas home. Their back fence became the border between the settlement and the village of Masha. من اول ما صارت المستوطنه اجوا تدريجي ما جوش مره واحده. اول شيء الحكومه الاسرائيليه عملت هناك معسكر جيش. معسكر الجيش حطت فيه مستوطنين كلال، بعدين كان المعسكر بكل المستوطنين. وبدوا يزيدوا، هسه في الفتره الاولى كانوا يعملوا علاقات جيده مع الناس ويحترموا الناس ويشعروهم انه احنا فيش بيننا مشاكل وجماعه وما ما كانوش يعتدوا على حدا. وبدهم رضا الناس هسا لما كو... لما كثرت المستوطنات وكثر المستوطنين صاروا يقولوا هذه الارض لنا وصاروا بدهم يعني وكاننا احنا في بلادنا غير شرعيين يعني بدهم يفهمونا بدهم يوصلوا لنا رساله انه المفروض احنا نهاجر من البلاد ويبكوا هم وكانها الارض لهم هسا بعد الجدار بعد الجدار اتمردوا نهائيا لانه على مدار سنين اللي فاتت الحكومه الاسرائيليه من بالذات من الناحيه الاعلاميه وصلت فهمت المستوطنين وفهمت المجتمع الاسرائيلي عموما انه انتم مستهدفين وانتم في عداوه مع العرب فالمفروض انتم هذول فهموا الشعب الاسرائيلي عامه انه هذول اعدائكم ولازم تبيدوهم يا ام ان انتم ما بدتهم مش هم بدهم يبيدوكم هذا الكلام مش صحيح ورايح يتحمل المسؤوليه مسؤوليه الكلام هذا والضرر اللي ناتج عنه اول شيء الشعب الفلسطيني ثاني شيء الشعب الاسرائيلي وكمان العالم جميعا تحمل المسؤوليه هذه 
In early 2003, the Israeli military told the Armas that their home, the home they had lived in for over 30 years, lay in the path of the so-called separation barrier that Israel was constructing throughout the West Bank. The soldiers gave the Armas two choices, leave their home and let it be demolished so that the barrier could be built, or stay in their house and have the barrier built between their home and their village. The Armas refused to move. Hani Armour gave the Israeli military a third choice, build the separation barrier between their house and the settlement. At first the soldiers agreed, but the settlers refused to accept this and demanded that the barrier be moved away from the settlement. Four months later, the Israeli military evicted the Armour family. When the Armours were allowed to return, they found their olive and citrus saplings, grapevines, flowers and decorative trees destroyed, and a military road running in front of their house where their plant nursery used to be. The military then built the separation barrier between the Armour's home and their village, but instead of erecting a fence as they had done for other sections of the barrier, they built a 25-foot high concrete wall, 240 feet long, blocking the Armour's view of their village as their punishment for refusing to move. The Armour's home is now surrounded on three sides by a 12-foot high steel fence and on the fourth side by the wall. For the first seven months after the wall was built, the Armour's could only enter and leave their home when the Israeli military opened the small steel gate at the side of the wall. In early 2004, 20 settler men came inside the Armour's gate and smashed the family's water tank, solar panels and windows with rocks. After the stoning, Israel's Channel 1 TV station produced a show comparing the Armour's life to life in a prison. Embarrassed by this coverage, the Israeli military reluctantly gave the Armour's a key to the small gate, seven months after it had been built but they threatened the armors that the key would be taken back if the family had any more outside visitors. مش بس علي حتى على المواطن الإسرائيلي نفسه إذا بعارض أفكارهم على أي يهودي في الدنيا بعارض أفكارهم بحاربوه Hani, Munira and their six children are imprisoned in their own home. The Israeli military are their prison guards. Hani must ask permission every time he wants to drive to his fields. Munira Ama is trapped at home unwilling to leave even to go to the doctor for fear that settlers will try to evict them while she is out. Building the wall has not only destroyed the armor's way of earning a living, but also devastated their ability to simply live off their land. The Israeli government is trying to force them to move by making their life unlivable. The wall at Massa is a part of the Israeli apartheid wall, a combination of ditches, trenches, roads, razor wire, electronic fences, and in places, concrete walls rising to a height of 25 feet. Under construction since June 2002, the Israeli government claims that it is building the wall in order to protect the security of Israel. But the root of the wall reveals its real purpose. Over three quarters of the total length of the wall, constructed and projected, lies inside the West Bank.
the apartheid wall is being used to seize more Palestinian land in order to secure and expand Jewish settlements within the West Bank. In July 2005 alone, Israel took more land in the West Bank than it surrendered by leaving Gaza. The wall separates Palestinians from their land. Of the first 47 Palestinian towns and villages along the wall's route, 21 have been isolated from more than half of their land by the wall. Residents of Masha village, including the Armas, lost access to over 90% of their land when the wall was completed there in November 2003. The wall is also being used to annex many of the most important underground wellsprings in the West Bank in order to divert water to Israel and West Bank settlements. The Israeli military has destroyed more than one million olive and fruit trees to make way for the wall. Thousands of Palestinians depend on these groves for their livelihoods. But such devastation serves a yet deeper purpose, to destroy a way of life by which Palestinians have lived for centuries. By making their life unlivable, the wall is forcing Palestinians to leave their land and move into designated enclaves within the West Bank, just as Native Americans were forced onto reservations by the US government over a century ago destroying the way of life by which they had lived for centuries. والسبب اللي نقول لأنه اللي نقلهم الصورة وسائل الإعلام الحكومية والحكومات تبعهم وبالذات في في العالم أقطاب شر اللي هي الحكومة الأمريكية والحكومة البريطانية والحكومة الإسرائيلية وفي يدور في فلكهم أغلب الحكومات في العالم ومن ضمنها الحكومات العربية هسا إحنا بدورنا كشعوب بغض النظر من وين من أي بلد وظيفتنا إن وصل للشعوب a network of military and settler roads now extends throughout the West Bank, linking Jewish settlements directly with Israel. The Israeli human rights group Bet Salem reports that Palestinians are barred from, or have restricted access to, 450 miles of such roads. A system, they say, with clear similarities to South Africa's former apartheid regime. <laughs> 